Take your seats. One minute till we start. Come in and take your seats, please. People out in the foyer, come in. You know, God is never late. He's always on time. So if you aren't in your seat, you're ungodly, but we love you. And we aren't gonna condemn you, but we will tell you you're ungodly. Get in your seat. You need to do what needs to happen. I tell you, everybody who feels really important ought to try and gather people in after a break. It just humbles you. <laughs> Makes you feel like nobody's listening. Those of you that are here are listening. That's awesome. We still got people just standing out there and talking like I'm not saying nothing. All right, time to start. So welcome to our first day of school. I tell you, there is nothing like first day at Karis Bible College. It's just awesome. It is really great. We're so excited. I think this is the 28th time that we've done this, and it seems like it gets better every year. It's awesome. So, man, we are so glad that you are here. How many of you aren't registered? I know that that's already been asked, but and they gave the announcement about getting registered. But we would like to see how many of you are here who have not registered, but you are committed to coming to school. Would you stand up so that we could see those of you who are here, you just haven't registered yet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Awesome. Well, welcome. We are glad that you are here. I've got some things that I want to share with you. I just want to say, first of all, that you know, God has a purpose, a destiny for every one of us. And many times we don't uh, recognize how God is moving in our life. And we think it's just us. We think it's just our decisions. But, you know, the scripture says in Jeremiah chapter 1, the Lord spoke to Jeremiah and he said, Before I formed you in the womb, before you came forth out of your mother's belly, I sanctified you and I ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. And Paul said a similar thing in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. He says, When it pleased God who separated me under the gospel from my mother's womb to reveal, that might be uh, Galatians 2.15, but anyway, it's 1 or 2.15. It's right there close. But it shows that God had a purpose for you from your mother's womb. And many times we just don't recognize how God is moving in our life. But uh, I believe it's God that brought you here. And I want you to just place a real importance on this because, you know, for you to leave where you've come from, to come here, leave jobs, leave family, uh, enter into all of these unknowns and stuff, I believe that God spoke to you or you wouldn't have done something like that. But you need to put value on it. I've got a lot of things I'd love to share with you. I hadn't got time to do it, but I do have a book that's entitled uh, The Four Keys to Staying Full of God. And it's based on Romans 1, And the first thing that people did to lose the uh, presence of God that he had placed in their life, it says they didn't glorify him as God. And I looked that word glorify up in the Greek and it means to render or esteem glorious. And then I looked up render and esteem. And the word esteem means to place value on. You have to value what God has done. And Satan is going to do everything he can to devalue what God has spoken to you. But if you continue to place value on what God has spoken to you and know that God's plans for you are only good, Jeremiah 29, 11, that his thoughts towards you are peace so that you can have an expected end. If you really believe that and trust that and keep value in what God has done, then regardless of what Satan does to come against you and try and devalue what's happening here, I guarantee you, you will, you will see the end results. Amen. It'll work. All you got to do is just continue on the same path that God has given you. So we've got a little video that I've chosen to play 
for every uh, group as they come in because uh, this happened and, uh, you know, the Lord spoke to me and called me in 1968. And in 1992, I was in England. And I mean, out of the blue, God just spoke to me about starting a Bible school. It was the last thing on my mind. It was the last thing I ever wanted. And God spoke to me when I was in England. And on that exact same day in Houston, Texas, there's a man named Gilbert Jackson who owned this property. And he and his brother owned nearly all of Woodland Park. They were land investors. And he had never given credit to the Lord because he felt like people that needed the Lord were people that needed a crutch. He was, he was wealthy. He was prosperous. He had all these things and he just never gave any credit to the Lord. And his hospice worker, he had cancer and only had a short time to live. And his hospice worker, a woman who only had a third grade education, Merlene Jackson, uh, she led him to the Lord. And he was this intellectual that placed everything on, on uh, intellect. She led him to the Lord and he got born again. And the next day he had a vision and saw these buildings and he dedicated this property to Christian education. And I didn't know any of those things. God spoke to me. I drove by here every day because I lived out in Florissant and I drove by here every day, had no idea that we would someday own this place. And yet God put it together and when his daughter and son-in-law saw what we were doing, they told us that this is Gilbert's vision. And we've got a little video that will show this. And the reason I'm playing this is to show you that, man, God, I just received a little word. I didn't know any of these things. But it has proven that God is working. This is an absolute miracle what's happening, and, and you're now a part of it. So I want you to see this video. I think it will really bless you, and then I'll be back. Is it possible that God could ordain a destiny for a piece of property? The purpose of the sanctuary in Woodland Park was ordered by the Lord through the intersection of many lives over many years to see it become a launching place of blessings to the whole world. It was the kind of property where we needed to share it. It was just so amazing and so beautiful. And we really felt God's presence there in such a strong way that you have no choice but to share that. It was a special place. We knew for a fact that the what we called Red Hawk Ranch, which is now the sanctuary, we knew that land was special. We knew it was, it was, it had really been set aside. We realized what a beautiful spot that was and a perfect location. So we chose to, to build the house there. We almost knew as we were building it that it wasn't gonna be for us forever, even though we called it our forever home. We almost felt like it was for a greater purpose. Andrew Womack saw that property and he had told me he had driven by for years and years coming, coming down from the mountains through Woodland Park. None of us would have known what God had in store for it. Dad was a visionary. His ideas for the for properties in general were different from your average developer or property owner. He owned a lot of property in Houston and Texas and also in Colorado. When I met Gilbert Jackson, he was everything I thought he would be. He was uh, very intellectual. He was um, extremely smart, highly educated, successful. He did not connect any kind of spiritual aspect to his business dealings at all. He intellectualized it from an early age and, and, and up to the very end, uh, I couldn't ever imagine um, actually having a conversation about the person of Jesus um, in his life and even our lives. So he accepted us uh, with our beliefs and our, and our um, what he would probably describe it maybe as a crutch. Uh, he, didn't need, he didn't need Jesus, we did. 
we wanted to honor God by using these beautiful properties for God's glory. Dad did not see it that way, you know, but we were able to do that anyway before he died. And I think he saw that, you know, in our hearts as well, but he didn't join in right away with that until the very end. In 1992, Dad uh, came down with cancer, had colon cancer, and he had surgery, chemo and radiation, the whole bit. One of the ladies that came to work um, as one of the nurses not only was a fabulous cook that we all benefited from, but she was just an angel. She was a, a believer and um, she uh, was able to be there the night of his 74th birthday. She said, Mr. Jackson, there's just one thing I know you're missing. And he was like, what? You're holding out on me? You have some secret that I don't know? And uh, she, she told me later, she said, I wasn't prepared, I wasn't prepared. She said, but God just gave me the words. Never in a million years my, uh, in my mind would I think that Merlene uh, and Gilbert would have this relationship where she didn't convince him of anything other than to show him who Jesus was and how to, how to attain that salvation. Marlene said she just kept, you know, repeating scripture and whatever would God would put on her heart to say. And he literally visualized Jesus standing in the door, extending his hand to him um, to step through the door and become a believer. And dad argued with Jesus because he said, I'm not worthy. I'm I've done, you know, bad things and not been a great person and those kind of things. And Jesus, of course, said, it doesn't matter. Step through this door and, and he did. He took Jesus' hand and he stepped through that door and the rest is history. Upon dedicating his life to the Lord, Gilbert also dedicated his properties. He had always been a strong advocate of education, but after his conversion, his only desire was that people learn to know Jesus. With only 11 days to live, the little stars celebrated with Debbie's father his new way of life and his new way of thinking. At the same time, halfway around the world in England, God spoke to Andrew Womack about starting Karis Bible College. After what Dad called his conversion experience, um, when we discussed the properties, he had always talked about his properties in a very business-like way. Now his focus had changed and he said, these properties need to be put together and used for Christian uses, Christian endeavors, Christian education. He was a big into education. Mark and I had lived in Woodland Park for several years uh, and in different areas and after dad died, um, uh, we received that property. Uh, we decided to build a house out there. That's where we wanted to be all the time. So we made plans to build the big house. And it took about 10 months, I think, to build it. We had a wonderful experience. Some friends of ours that knew we were building had some missionary friends come visit them. And they said, could we come out and see the property? And we said, sure. And um, we had broken ground, but it wasn't real far underway yet. And they were missionaries and they just said, you know what, can we just pray for y'all? We said, absolutely. What was their idea? for the four of us to face in four different directions, north, south, east, and west, and back to back, we were back to back facing in those directions, and we prayed for that property. They prayed and we prayed for the property, for the construction, just for God to bless it, for God to use it as He would have His way with it. And uh, it was a very powerful moment for Mark and I. We, we did say that it's our forever and ever house, and yet we somehow God had started putting on us that this was never for us in the first place, but we were supposed to build it. David, David had a, a dream that, that we had been equipped and we had everything we, we needed to, to move God's kingdom forward with the uh, things that Gilbert had passed on to us and passed down to us. In 1999, Mark and I had decided with our girls that we needed to move back to Texas to be closer to our families. So um, we decided to sell the property and the Sturmans bought the property from us. Carol and Eddie had known that we had used the property in special ways in the past. We, they knew that it was a very special property and that our desire for it 
was that it should be used and shared. Then they ended up uh, selling the property to Andrew Womack Ministries. And um, evidently when uh, the Andrew Womack Ministries was inquiring about the property, the Sturmans had said, oh, the Little Stars will be very happy to know this, that there are going to be a Bible college here and that there will be people from all over the world enjoying this property and this home. And um, it just was a win-win situation for everyone, for them, for us, for Andrew Womack, and for all of God's people that, will, that have been there and will be there in the future. The Little Stars now realized that their father's vision for the property was coming true, even down to a Christian education building he had seen in his final hours, a structure that would have glass walls so the students could see the beauty of Pikes Peak. Throughout the design process of the sanctuary, Andrew knew nothing of Gilbert's vision. But as his plans were made public, the Little Stars could see that God had planted Gilbert's vision in the mind of Andrew Womack revealing his hand in the entire process. So we get a, I get a call from Andrew and he introduced himself. We had heard that a ministry was buying it, but Andrew called me on my cell phone and, and it was one of those special conversations. It was sort of like, in only a God way, uh, this happened. I started sharing with, with Andrew, really, the history of this property. And of course, Deb and I are, are ecstatic that we couldn't have dreamed this. We couldn't have uh, sat down on a whiteboard or a yellow legal pad as we used to with Gilbert and, and figured this out. It was, it, there was too many variables. There were too many unknowns. There was no way we could have ever imagined this happening. And yet, um, in that phone call, um, it just hit me and then hit us that uh, God, God did this and He continues to do this. One person, uh, Merlene, changed one person Gilbert. It only takes one person with a little faith and uh, some courage to go out and change the world. So that's our prayer for uh, not only our own lives, but for the ministry of Andrew Womack and Karis Bible College, that everyone that walks and rides and drives through those gates and sits in those sessions will know that it just takes one person to change the world. In, in looking back and reflecting on where this property has come from, um, before we had it, while we had it, and as it's passed on, to see now that all these people through Andrew Warmick Ministries, the, the lessons that are being taught, the lives that are being changed, the ripple effect of all of that is mind boggling. It's just really overwhelming to think and to see God's hand so clearly moving. And, you know, we pray for things and we expect things, and maybe in our lifetime we see them and maybe we don't, but in our lifetime we're seeing the hand of God clearly using that property for His ultimate glory, and what a beautiful thing. The stories that come out of it, the healing that comes out of it, the blessings, not only for those students, but for the, the people that those students will then go and change because of the, what they've experienced in that place. It's, it's a beautiful thing. God is so good. He is so good. Hallelujah. Man, I tell you, that gets me all choked up watching that. But you know, you just hear a little word from God and you do something and then you find out that that was just a part of the piece of the puzzle and God is working supernaturally to put all of this together. And uh, I'm sharing that to say with you that you've got a word from God. You've heard from God and you've taken a step 
And it may be 20 or 30 years in the future before you realize exactly the way that God is using this decision that you've made and knitting it together to make not only your life what he wants it to be, but touching so many other people's lives. Amen. You know, you're going to make friends here that'll be possibly friends for the rest of your life. They could be ministry associates. And I'm just asking you to really glorify God, to put the proper value on what God has spoken to you. And if you do that, then as things, you know, get to where all of the newness is worn off. And I hate to even mention this, but it happens. You, some of you will just get overcome with getting up early every day. <laughs> I remember one of the ladies in our first class, she says, I just, she slept until 11 o'clock. She was a night person. She didn't get up in, in early in the morning. And 11 o'clock was when she normally got up. And it just graded on her to come to school and she was going to quit class. And I, she came in to tell me and I had to talk to her and say, look, you got to put priorities on things. If God spoke to you, I guarantee you coming here is more important than you just getting your, uh, you know, your normal routine. We had another lady talk. <laughs> I hate to even mention that, but she says that it interrupted her bowel movements. <laughs> having to get up this early. You know what? There's some things a little bit more important. And you have to just really place a value on this. And you know what? God start, it's just continuing to grow. Not only do you see this right here, but did you know they mentioned the Sturmans are the ones who bought this property from the Little Stars. And the Sturmans built that building that's about a mile away over on, on our North Campus. And uh, it's a 60,000 square foot building that's beautiful. And when we first bought this 157 acres, uh, we thought that this was all we were going to have. But uh, I mean, within just very short period of time, matter of fact, I was in Uganda when they signed the papers on this and Jamie was at the uh, signing. She's the one that signed the papers. And while they were there, the Sturman said, you know, our building here is also for sale and we think you should have it. And so they made it available and we talked about it. And I'd say within a year after us buying this and starting the process, every time I'd drive out and I'd see that white building sitting over on the other property, I'd pray for it. And pretty soon I just felt like we were going to have it. And we were in negotiation with the Sturmans for at least four or five times over the next five or six years. And every time it just came to an impasse because I wasn't going to go in debt. And um, anyway, long story, but I finally one time told him, I said, look, uh, we need to just quit this right now because I'm not going to go in debt. But I said, this property is ours. I said, we will have it someday. <laughs> and Carol Sturman, she was a businesswoman and she didn't have, she didn't have any of that. But her husband, Eddie, he's a Jew. He was sitting on the other side of Carol. And when I said, someday we will have this property, he goes, I believe. And finally, when this came up for sale, it's a long story, but uh, God just gave it to us. So we now have over 500 acres here and we are just in the process and I'm not going to spend any time announcing this. We, we, within the next uh, four months, five months, we will have some drawings and things, but we're beginning to turn this into a uh, facility that is not second class to anything else. It's going to have athletic facilities. It'll have uh, hotels, conference centers, performing art theaters, a bridge that connects the two properties together, a uh, student activity center over here that's going to be bigger than both of these buildings put together. And uh, we are in the process of doing that. And this is going to become the best place. I believe it's already the best as far as the content goes. But we need student housing and I think it's uh, next week or right after Labor Day. So that's a week from today, I guess, they are gonna start uh, the uh, excavation for the student housing. So, and all of this is set in motion by, of course, Gilbert got born again. God spoke to him, gave him a vision, but then the Lord spoke to me in England on the exact same day that he dedicated this property to the Lord. The Lord spoke to me 
and told me about starting a Bible school. It was 16 years later before we bought this property and then we built these buildings without knowing these things. And all of this started by God just speaking a word. And you have a word from God. You know, I just want to share this with you. I was thinking about this this morning out of uh, Matthew chapter 14. And this is where the Lord constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side. And the word constrain, matter of fact, the NIV says he compelled. That means that there was resistance on their part. And the scripture doesn't explain what the resistance was, but a lot of these guys had been fishermen on that very uh, lake, the Sea of Galilee. And they were used to these storms. They would come over the mountains and I mean just descend on the Sea of Galilee quickly. And I believe that there were signs that a storm was brewing and that's probably why there was resistance on their part. And Jesus had to constrain them, compel them to get into the ship and go to the other side. So that's significant. That means that there was maybe, they, they weren't in agreement, but to their credit, they obeyed God. And I think that this could uh, relate to some of you that you may feel constrained to be here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe uh, God has just put it on your heart so much that you had to obey, but there may be a number of questions and things that you're having. But to their credit, they got into the boat and they headed to the other side. It's only a two hour trip across the Sea of Galilee. I've been on that sea. We had this little boat called the Jesus boat and we had about 50 people in it and we anchored in the Sea of Galilee and I just spent two hours teaching about all of the things that happened right there and Jesus walking on the sea. It was really neat. But it's normally only a two hour trip across the Sea of Galilee. And yet here they left at sunset and in the fourth watch of the night, that means it was between three and 6 a.m., so they had spent somewhere around at least six to nine hours that they had been trying to get to the other side and they were only halfway across. So if you stop and think about it, this means that even though everything was contrary, it looked like they might drown, they were still doing what God told them to do. It says the wind was contrary to them. So, you know, all they would have had to do is turn that boat around, put the sail up, and in just minutes, they'd have been back to the safety of shore. But they were still pointed in the direction that God told them to go. Now, they weren't great faith giants. They thought they were all going to drown. <laughs> the Lord didn't tell them, go, you know, get into the boat and go halfway across and drown. He told them to go to the other side. So they had a word from God but it wasn't working out the way that they thought. And this is something that, you know, we see happen to people all the time. They hear from God, they come here and they just expect that when you are obeying God, that the devil packs up and leaves, that there is no problems. Matter of fact, this is how a lot of people discern whether something is God's will or not. They go by how much opposition they get. And if they don't get a place to live and if they don't get a job and if there's any problems, they say, well, it must not be God. You know, the apostle Paul said just the opposite. He said, there is a great and an effectual door open unto us, but there are many adversaries. I don't believe you need to judge what God tells you to do by circumstances, if things work out or not. That is very, very immature. That's going back to Gideon, putting out a fleece. And if the fleece gets wet, you know, and the ground's dry and stuff, the only problem with putting out fleeces is that you're liable to get fleeced. You don't determine God's will by how easy something is. He told them to go to the other side and yet they ran into a storm and they had spent six to nine hours covering what it normally had cost one hour, take one hour to accomplish and it looked like they were gonna drown. Things were not working the way that they anticipated them, but to their credit, they kept doing what God told them to do instead of turning around and heading for the safety of the shore. And many of you have taken a step and right now, first day of school is awesome, but I guarantee you after a while, there will be things getting away. And are you going to continue to do what God told you to do? You know, when the Lord spoke to me and told me to start this school, that was on uh, June the 22nd of 1992 that the Lord spoke to me in England. When I came back, I was so excited. I told my staff, I told everybody, we're starting a school. And I expected to start in uh, September 
of 92. And did you know it just couldn't happen? It was, it was actually September of 94 is when we started. It took a year and a half or two years to get it done. But we, I had a word from God. We could have aborted. We could have quit. We, and then when we started the school, I anticipated that we'd start with 100 students. We had 30 students. And, uh, you know, the school, I'm not saying this to complain or anything, but just put things into perspective. Our school has never broken even. I subsidize this school up to $4 million a year. If we charge the tuition that it took to pay for everything that's happened, and that's not even including all the buildings. My ministry builds these buildings debt free and gives them to the school. And then the, all of the administration expenses and everything, we're anywhere from two to $4 million a year that I sink into this and keep it going. Our school is never paid for itself. That's going to change. But this building program that I'm starting, I'm thinking it's going to be 600 million. My CEO says 750 million. Uh, the school will never pay for that. I'm going to pay for all of these buildings and things. And, and so anyway, my point is when we started this school, I thought we'd have 100 students. We had 30. And uh, it was a drain on us. Matter of fact, I had to go and take out a loan the very first uh, missions trip that we ever took because we, we went in the hole $25,000 and we couldn't pay for things and I had to take out a loan to cover it. And um, so anyway, it, we could have quit. We could have said it's just too much effort. And then since we already had the facilities for 100 people, we allowed all of these street people to come in. We allowed all of the drunks and everybody to come in and they had fist fights and we actually had people sent to the hospital in ambulances. And I guarantee you, Jamie especially was just like, I don't think this is God. And, uh, and you know, we were still heading in the direction God gave us, but it looked like everything was not working. And we ran out of facilities. The very first building that we had, the one that Carrie came to, which it just amazes me that people would have come to that facility over on Robinson Street. It, she walked in the back door, which the front door wasn't very impressive, but the back door was really not impressive. And when Carrie walked in, she said, the Lord just spoke to her and he says, you're gonna be with this ministry forever. And... Uh, Man, it's proven to be true. How many years ago was that? 23. 23 years ago, the Lord brought her and she went through school and then went to Russia for 16 years. Met Mike over there. They ran our ministry over there, put us on TV, translated books. And now they've been back here for, I think, six years. But anyway, there was just so many obstacles. It has never been easy. And many people come and see what we have now and they see the first day and everybody just loving God and praising God. Those prophecies that Daniel gave today were just absolutely awesome. And they see what's happening and they just think it's easy. It's never been easy. And it's still not easy. And I'm saying these things for you, that you've got a word from God. He told them to get into that ship and go to the other side. God told you to come here. Not so you could drown. Amen. Not so that you could die halfway across. Not so that you could abort and quit before you reach the end thing. He called you here and I'm just encouraging you. Don't let Satan steal from you. He comes immediately to steal away the word. Sitting under the word of God is by far the most important thing you will ever do in your life. Amen. Not only for your spiritual growth, but for your family, for your business, for whatever it is that God calls you to do. This is the most important thing I believe God has ever spoken to you and your future is so bright you got to squint to look at it. But Satan is going to come against you and you have to have the same commitment that these guys had to just keep going, keep doing it. They could have turned around. They could have been safe in a relatively short period of time, but they were still heading in the direction that God called them. And anyway, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Just for time's sake, I'm going to summarize some of it. But they were in the midst of the sea. The boat was full. 
and they saw Jesus walking on the water. And let me just read some of this to you. Uh, in verse 25, it says, this is Matthew 14, 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Let me also, man, I've got a whole book on this. I've written a book on this very thing entitled How to Be a Water Walker. I'd encourage you to get it. It's really good. But Jesus is the one that constrained them. That means it wasn't their idea. It was his idea. Amen. His will, his bill. That's what Carrie says. Amen. So God is the one who told you to come here. And that means that God knows what you're in. He knew the situation that these guys were in. He wasn't sleeping in the Hilton out of the weather and dry. He was out in the exact same storm that they were in. He knew all of these things. God knows what's going on in your life. Sometimes people will think, well, God, if you sit me here, how come things have worked out this way? God's not the one that caused the storm because he rebuked it. He wouldn't have rebuked his father. He wouldn't have rebuked something that he caused. This wasn't a God caused thing, but, and whatever problems you enter into, God's not the author of those things, but he knows what you're in. And so he came walking on top of the water. He was walking on top of the very thing that was killing them. Did you know it's no big deal to God? Sometimes people say, God, how am I going to pay my bills? I remember back in my poverty days that I heard Jamie praying one day and she says, I don't care what he says. Says, if my baby ever goes without food, I'll go get a job. And we were really struggling and we didn't have baby food for that day. We were down to our last jar of baby food and it was crisis situation. I needed 67 cents and I didn't have it. I know some of you are thinking I'm exaggerating things. This is, we didn't have credit cards. We didn't have a phone because we didn't have enough money to put a phone down, uh, put any deposit down on the thing. If we'd have died, it had taken until somebody smelled us before <laughs> they could have come. We didn't, we were just cut off. We were totally nothing. We hadn't eaten in two weeks. We had put all of the money into buying baby food. And I called ORU's prayer tower and said, please pray with me and agree for 67 cents because Jamie was going to quit the ministry if we didn't have. That was a big deal to me. I know you all think that that's no big deal, but I mean, I had been out on the, on the roadside picking up Coke bottles and selling them. And uh, I'd done everything that we knew to do and it was a crisis situation. And I called and prayed and asked for 67 cents and feeling like, God, don't you care? These guys probably felt that same way. God cares. God knows what's going on. And we did get the 67 cents. I took the back seat out of the car and found some money in the back seat. <laughs> and that got us over that crisis. But anyway, he came walking on top of the very thing that was about to kill them. You may think that this is such a big deal. It's no big deal to God. I was talking to some people just this week and they were talking about believing God for, uh, you know, millions of dollars to do something. And I said that money is never an issue. Money isn't even important. I know some of you are thinking, man, what world do you come from? <laughs> money is just a tool. And God's got more money. Did you know that there are more $100 bills than there are $1 bills? That's a fact. There is no shortage of money. People think that there's this pie and that, you know, you've got your little slice and that you've got a limited number of slices. God is limitless. He'll tell you how to go get money out of a fish's mouth if you need. Money is never the problem. Never ever is money the problem. It's your faith that's the problem. And if you tie yourself to that money and because you don't have it in your wallet, you go to limiting God, that lack of faith, that unbelief is the problem. He was walking on top of the very thing that was destroying them. And I guarantee you, God's not wringing his hands wondering how am I gonna pull this off? Man, we're in a recession. Do you realize that Woodland Park has a shortage of housing? How is this ever gonna work? Man, God will create a house. He'll do, he'll do whatever. There is no problem with God. Don't limit God by your small thinking. 
He was walking on top of the very thing that was about to kill them. And it says in verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear and look at Jesus. He said, but straightway Jesus spake unto them saying, be of good cheer. It is I be not afraid. There's something I need to point out that's not here in Matthew, but if you read this in Mark's account in Mark chapter six, it says that when Jesus came walking on the water, he made as though he would have passed by them. You know, the reason he came out there was to help them. He wasn't just out for a stroll in the midst of a storm <laughs> walking on the water. He came to help them, but he would have passed by them if they hadn't have called out. And there are some people that when they get into a strait, they just trust themselves and they look to other things and they look to all, they, they start trying to figure every way they can make things work and they don't call on the Lord. He's always there. He's aware of your situation, but you've got to place a demand on his power to see it manifest in your life. Mark six says they would, he would have walked by them, but when they saw him, they cried out for fear and he said unto them, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Now, if all he wanted to do was cheer them up, why didn't he just still the storm and get them to the other side? Seems like that would have taken care of it. But see, God, you can say will not, but you can say cannot move in your life if there is no faith present. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. And most people put a period right there and they just say, Jesus is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. That's not true. It goes on to say, according to the power that works in you. If you don't have any power working in you, if you've got fear operating in you instead of faith, you can stop God. The reason he said that for them to be of good cheer, he needed some response of faith from these guys. He needed them to do something so that he could release his power and do what he wants to do. It's the same thing with us. You got to exhibit a little bit of faith. Man, we sang these songs about the day. He's never lost a battle and he never will. And we were all shouting and screaming. That's wonderful during praise and worship, but when the bill collectors come and they tell you you're gonna be evicted if you don't play, are you gonna still be singing the same song? You gotta have some faith working in you. And then Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. One word, one word, from Jesus was enough to overcome all of the natural effects of everything that was going on. One word from God is more than enough to totally transform your life and turn, turn your situation around. God gave me one word to start a Bible college. I had no idea what it would lead to. I had no idea he had already spoken to Gilbert Jackson that same day. I had no idea of all of these things, but you just take that one word. One word is enough to overcome anything that is opposing you. You have a word from God. That's why you're here. God spoke, you're here. God spoke to you. You have a word from God. And Peter got out of the boat. You know, everybody wants to have the testimony of walking on water, but most people won't get out of the boat. You are the ones that got out of the boat. You've left where you were. You've left your security of your job and your family. You're walking on water. This is miracle. Some of you are doing things that you never would have thought you were doing. This is an absolute miracle. You've got a word from God and you've acted on it and you're here. But as he walked on the water, it says, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried saying, Lord, save me. Have you ever seen anybody begin to sink? I've never seen anybody walk on water, but every person I've ever seen that jumped in the water, they didn't begin to sink. They just plop. They will go up down immediately. This is important here that as long as he was looking at Jesus, the author and the finisher of his faith, he was able to walk on water. 
But when he saw the wind and the waves, the wind and the waves didn't have anything to do with him walking on water. He couldn't have walked on water if it had been a perfectly calm day. But you know what it did? It took his attention off of Jesus. And when he took his attention off of Jesus, he began to sink. And did you know that this is true for everyone? Every one of you have got a word from God. You've taken a step. You are walking on the water. You are living in the miraculous right now. You've done something that is absolutely out of character for you because you've heard from God and you've done this. But there's going to be wind and there's going to be storms And if you get to looking at those things, instead of keeping your attention on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, you will begin to sink. You won't sink all at once. You'll just begin to sink. And the moment you start seeing any of this doubt, any of this fear, any of these negative thoughts, like I was teaching on Friday night when we had this, that Abraham and Sarah, if they had been mindful of the country they came out of, they might've had opportunity to return. The moment you find yourself thinking about, man, I wonder what it's like back home. I wouldn't have had these problems if I was there. Uh, you know, it's, it's 80 degrees back in Florida and it's snowing here. And the moment you can begin to start thinking like that, you need to take those thoughts captive because you don't sink all at once. It's a process. And the moment you see anything contrary to the word that God has given you, just discount it. You know, we were talking about all of these buildings and like I was saying, my CEO is saying it could be $750 million. And we were looking at some pictures and things and he had his calculator out and I said, Billy, what are you doing? And he says, I'm figuring out how much. And I said, stop it. (laughs) I said, we aren't going to limit God by sitting here and just seeing how much money we got. I don't have, I don't have a hundred million dollars. There's no point in us sitting here and limiting God. You've got to stop those thoughts and take them captive immediately. You don't sink all at once. It just creeps in little by little. And let me combine this with Hebrews chapter 12. I've already quoted in verse one. It says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. This is what Peter was doing. Peter, as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was walking on the water. He was doing things that he couldn't have done on his own. But it goes on to say, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Did you know Jesus operated in this same thing? Instead of focusing on the suffering that he was going to go through, he was aware of it and he did deal with it in the garden of Gethsemane and even uh, prayed and asked God to take away. If it was possible, he sweat as it were great drops of blood. I'm not saying he was not aware of what was going on, but this says for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He wasn't focused on the suffering. He was focused on what the suffering would produce. You know what the joy was? It was us. Jesus looked beyond the suffering and he saw you. And of course he saw all of the believers worldwide, but just in the context of people here, he saw you that someday you were going to be taking a step of faith. You were going to hear his voice. You were going to come here and he was willing to suffer everything he went through, not only physically, but spiritually actually went to hell. And he suffered all of these things because he saw you and thought you were worth it. He set the joy before him. This is the way you've got to endure. You've got to set this joy before you. You've got to see the end results. You got to look past the hardships that it takes and you've got to see the end results And it goes on to say, he endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. Your mind is where all of this comes in and you get weary and you faint in your mind. If you lose the enthusiasm that you've had today and the enthusiasm that you've had coming here It's because in your mind, 
you have not been considering Jesus. You took your eyes off of Jesus. You look at the wind and the waves and that's what causes us to begin to sink. And the moment you see that, you need to call out. You need to put your attention back on Jesus. When Peter began to sink, he called out to Jesus and Jesus lifted him up. And it doesn't say that he carried him back to the boat. I believe that he and Peter walked back to the boat. And then if you read this same account in John chapter six, when they got back to the boat, immediately the boat and the disciples and everything were translated to the other side of the lake and they were on the other side. It was a great miracle. And you know, there's things just like this for each one of us. If you begin to sink, it's because you've taken your eyes off of Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Because you quit looking at the word that he gave you. You're turning around and heading for the safety of shore instead of continuing to go in the same direction that God called you. So I really felt impressed to just share these things with you, to share that video with you today and let you know that just one word has started all of this. And one word, you have one word. God has started you on a journey. That if the Lord tarries, you'll look back and you'll see that this just jump-started all kinds of miracles and you'll meet other people and it'll, all of these things will come together. I believe one of the greatest things about heaven is when we get to heaven, we'll see what was going on in the unseen realm and how God was putting things together and when we get to heaven, we'll see how that God brought people here and uh, all of the connections and the different things, the way that God changes lives, it'll just transform you. Amen. Amen. I'm out of time, got more to say, but I believe that'll bless you and help you. Amen. All right, let's take a break. We'll be back for the next class.